Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. With me today is Dr. Doug Ritchie. Now, everybody knows Doug Ritchie. He is the inventor of the Ritchie Brace, and we, we will talk about that, but we're going to talk about a lot of other things as well, because I reckon he has had a very, very interesting career, which we're about to find out about. So, Doug, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Tyson. Thank you. So, first of all, I know you are a busy man, so thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm going to dive straight into a really, really tough question, and that is, why did you start podiatry in the first place? Well, I started podiatry. I, I was I definitely wanted to go into some career in medicine when while I was in undergraduate studies, and I was working as an orderly at a hospital in Long Beach uh, in the operating room. Actually, I was watching a lot of surgeries and thinking I might want to be a surgeon, and there was a uh, orthopedic surgery technician in there who was going to podiatry school. Okay. And I asked, and I asked him, what, what the hell is podiatry? I don't, what is this? <laughs> what year is this? Uh, this was in 1976. Okay. So he told me about it. And uh, <clears throat> I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in sports medicine. He said, well, podiatry is getting very involved in sports medicine. He said, in fact, we have a very famous podiatrist right here in Long Beach. This is where I lived and worked. Yeah. Uh, his name was John Pagliano. He, of course, had already become a legend in, in podiatric sports medicine. So I went and visited his practice, and I was absolutely captivated. Uh, he was seeing all these celebrity athletes that I knew of, professional players. J just in a random afternoon, I visited him and saw these world-class athletes. But most importantly, I was really interested in what he was doing for them mechanically and evaluating their gait. And I, I really became sold in one afternoon. Um, and then I subsequently went up and visited the school and visited other podiatry offices. But the long and short of it was, it was really the, the, the lure of podiatric sports medicine that brought me into the profession and really became the focus of my own professional life for 38 years. Why sports medicine? What were you doing at the time that what made you interested well, I, in that? I, you know, it's interesting. I had always been a, an aquatics athlete. I was a, I was a swimmer and water polo player uh, it, throughout my youth and first year of college. Um, but I love sports just as a spectator. And um, I, 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 re I really entertained the idea of going into athletic training. Okay. Uh, but I found out that, that the lifestyle of that wasn't really conducive and it wasn't a well-paying job. But the idea of working with athletes was very attractive to me, even from high school uh, level age onward. Okay, so even though it was sports that got you into it, very similar to myself, it was sports and orthotics that really interested me, that got me into podiatry. I was playing rugby league and athletics and doing all that at the time. But once I got into podiatry, all of a sudden there were a lot of other things we had to do, which oh, well, nobody told me about this. One, I didn't know we had to practice doing injections on each other. If I'd have known that, I, I don't think I probably would have done it because Neil's used to scare me at the time. So how did you cope with the other aspects of podiatry as you were going through? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I saw and wa I, I watched a lot of surgeries when I was working as an operating room orderly. But when I went to, when I visited the podiatry school and even when I started podiatry school, surgery didn't attract me that much it wasn't that I was turned off to it but yeah it, it, it didn't it didn't have the 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 draw that it did for many of my classmates they wanted to be surgeons and um, I, I would almost say reluctantly I, I learned surgery and realized it was going to be a, a big part of my practice but um, uh, I accepted it I also had to accept wound care and diabetes which was <laughs> not in any way part of the attraction for me <laughs> me either uh, and I, and I quickly kind of pushed that aside to other colleagues when I opened my office. But um, I, I, I realized that I could really subspecialize in sports medicine. And, and uh, even though I wouldn't turn away patients that were referred to me with other pathologies, um, I realized I, I, could, I could pretty much emphasize that as a subspecialty. Okay, so I think that's interesting because I know people go through podiatry and like like myself, I didn't know all the parts of podiatry or what I was gonna what I was in for when I started. And 
I think it's important what you said that if there's certain parts of podiatry that don't really float your boat, it's okay to push them to the side and not actually make that part of your day-to-day life. So I've, I've, anyone that's listening to this podcast knows that if I see an ulcer, I just, yeah, I lose my, I just can't do it. So yeah. I, I never wanted to go down that path at all. But there were other aspects of podiatry that wasn't what I really wanted to do, but I did it anyway because it was just part of the job. Yeah, and, and you know when I first opened my my practice, I I welcomed all patients because I needed the I needed the business, um, and I did a fair amount of routine foot care. And interestingly, that part of it didn't. I actually liked it. Yeah, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the one to one interaction with the patient, the relaxed visit, the low stress. That's but true. The part, but the good part was I wasn't doing it all day long. I was doing a routine foot care, and then I was seeing three high level athletes in a row. And sometimes it was a nice break from dealing with these neurotic, demanding athletes. Oh, you go yeah. in a room with a, a little old lady who just thought that I was the greatest thing on the face of the earth because I trimmed her toenails nicely. So <laughs> it, it was a good mix for a while. Toward, towards the end of my career, I, I didn't do any routine care, but yeah. I, I, it, was, it wasn't beneath me. And it was actually a good part of, of my mix, I have to say. No, that's good to hear because I think it's important. I had somebody else on the podcast and we were talking once that sometimes you don't know what you like in podiatry until you do it. So you might look yeah. at routine care and go, that's the, I don't really want to do that. But I agree with you. I used to find when I had a number of athletes and I used to find elite athletes, a bit of a pain in the ass because they'd yeah. read too many magazines and yeah, I found them difficult, preferred weekend warriors, but every now and then doing that general patient where you know, I could switch my brain off, just do something and have a really nice conversation with somebody i used to enjoy it every now and then but i must admit towards the end i didn't do routine care myself either yeah very similar so did you stop doing surgery at a certain time or did you continue to do surgery through your whole career you know it's interesting the more i tried not to do surgery the more i did surgery Um, why is that well I, i think the richie brace believe it or not grew my surgical practice in a way i never expected because um even though I taught Richie Brace treatments to all of my colleagues, really all over this country, but particularly in my geographic region, I got a lot of referrals from podiatrists uh, of their own patients asking me to do the Brace treatment. And as you know, the Richie Brace is used on pretty complex foot and ankle pathologies, and it doesn't yeah. always work. But, and if it didn't work, those patients would come back to me and ask me to do the surgery to fix the problem. And I found myself doing more complicated foot and ankle surgery in the last 10 years of my career than I ever thought I would be doing. Um, I actually liked it because it was challenging and I was working with residents, Um, but it it wasn't, I I did more of it than I wanted. I I had an, I would actually book out a whole day in the operating room and do seven or eight cases in a row, which I never thought I would do. And I found it exhausting. but I did it because I, I had this good relationship with many of these patients who trusted me to do it. And um, so I did it, but I, I certainly couldn't have ever envisioned myself being a pure foot and ankle surgeon because I still got much more gratitude out of my biomechanics interventions. Yeah. Uh, not, not only with the Ritchie brace, but just with foot orthotic therapy and padding, strapping, just very simple shoe modifications, the little things that we did that somehow changed a runner's life and they thought we were some miracle worker genius. But I think it's really important to have that strong biomechanics background as well as doing the surgery because a, a lot of the biggest complaint you hear sometimes about, say, an orthopedic surgeon in Australia, I'm not sure about America, but they've got these blinkers on and all they think about is surgery, just everything is surgery. They never, they don't consider too much the biomechanical aspect of what's going to happen after the surgery. So right. I think you really having that strong biomechanics background and interest in that area, I think would have to make you a better surgeon. Well, it did on many levels um, because I really think, I I don't think any foot and ankle surgeon should do surgery unless they understand the pathomechanics of the disorder, how it got there. If you don't know how how the bunion formed in this particular patient, you shouldn't be fixing the bunion because there are things you're gonna need to do afterward to assure the bunion doesn't come back again. Yeah, uh, And it's the same thing with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. I mean, you can go in and do tendon work and soft tissue repair, but 
if you don't understand the mechanics of that particular foot, you're going to have a failure within three years. This is what led to your book. I've got the title here, Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders, which came out in 2020. Did that, was it all this knowledge that you'd built up over the years? You went, I need to get this put in one yeah, place. You, you know, over the years, I developed a pretty broad and comprehensive uh, slate of lectures that I would give. And I gave many of them in Australia and really around the world. But uh, often the, the uh, members of the audience, colleagues of mine would come up and say, where can I read more about this information you just presented? And I would say, I don't know. Uh, there's nothing yeah. really written in a, in a comprehensive form. You know, people would even ask me, well, what's a good book on biomechanics? And I would say, well, the last book written was uh, 30 years ago, Ron Valmassey's text. So um, it, it occurred to me as I went along that someday I got to put together all of this information into a book. Uh, but I wanted to make the book practical. I didn't want to make it another book of biomechanics and certainly a book of theories of how the foot functions and how to fix the foot. I really wanted to make it evidence-based and more on, more relative to the, cl the clinician in dealing with foot disorders and the mechanical cause of, of foot disorders. And that's where the term pathomechanics comes from. So uh, my book is really looking at the most common disorders of the human foot and explaining to the reader based on, on the evidence today, what causes these disorders. That's good. And you have sent me a link to the book. So I'll put a link to that book in the show notes as well, because great. I think it's, I think it's great that people that have been in the profession for, for especially such a long period of time, which makes you sound old, but you're not. But I think I, I reckon if the more people in the profession that got their thoughts down on paper and got it uh, published, not that they're going to sell, sell a million copies, but even if it's just their opinion on certain things could be really helpful for other people that are actually coming through. If we had 150 different podiatry books, it, but there'd be so much knowledge there in one place. Well, you know, it's interesting that the most fruitful source of knowledge is a seasoned practitioner, particularly when he or she is at the end of their career. Yeah. And if every one of them could stop at, at the end of their career and look back on 40 years of practice, and share their pearls, their wisdom. Uh, but the problem is you get to that point in your career, as I did, and that's the last thing you want to do. You want to go out and start <laughs> playing golf. And, but it's really the golden time to, to take that knowledge and, and, and put it on paper so you don't forget it and other people can benefit from it. That's true. I noticed you are wearing a golf shirt, so that was uh, very fitting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's Because I know like, you've, you've retired now. But yes. I take it you're still very active in the profession uh, on the lecturing circuit? Yeah, you know, I retired early. Uh, I wasn't in any way burned out on my career and I had a thriving practice, but I always felt torn between the educational teaching side of my profession, my professional career, and then seeing patients. And I, I really felt that the time had come where I needed to devote most of my time, if not all my time to research and teaching. Yeah. And so I made the decision and did it. And uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I mean, I'm busy. I, I'm busy every day. I devote it to either some type of lecture, teaching, interaction with other colleagues. Uh, but I think I've become a lot more effective at that now that I'm not distracted by my practice. Um, and so to answer your question, yes, I'm very busy. I, uh, I think thanks to the pandemic and, and the, the virtual meetings and webinars, I've been able to reach out and interact with more colleagues in the last two years than I ever would have imagined because I haven't had to travel. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I often say there's this saying, and it was in, um, <laughs> mostly give my book a, a, a plug at the same time. In my first book, It's No Secret, There's Money in Podiatry, which <laughs> was, is a business book, not a podiatry book. Oh, it's a podiatry business book. But in there, I talk about this concept about the, um, the vital few and trivial many. And it's a concept where there's certain people who will just come into the profession, graduate, do the job, disappear, and no one will ever know their name, who they are. They don't really leave a void when they, it's filled very quickly. Then there's other people who 
give back to profession in so many different ways and they become one of the vital few. And when they do eventually leave, it, it leaves a, a gap there. But I think everybody should be striving to become one of the vital few to contribute to the profession somehow, whether it's biomechanics, whether it's surgery, whether it's wound care, whether it's business, we should all be striving to, to do something. I so when, when you leave, when you eventually leave, people go, geez, I miss them. Yeah. Instead of when you leave, they go, who was that person? Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. We need a lot more of that. And unfortunately, we don't see it. So I'll go, I know we, we spoke just before I press record that you, Richard Blake, was a year ahead of you. Yes. So it got me curious. It got me thinking. And, and he was on episode, I do have it written down here. So I was just going to rattle it off like I have a really good memory. It was episode 134, the inverted orthotic technique. I'm curious. When you and Richard went through it, I take it you knew each other? Yes. And you probably followed each other's careers as you went through. With what he was doing in podiatry, did that motivate you to do something? Or was it the other way around? Were you doing something that you feel may have motivated him? No, no, no. He was much more of a motivator to me than vice versa. Uh, he was so prolific while he was in school. Yeah. He was... He, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he was one of the few students who instructors would shoot, would, uh, I wouldn't say hire, but designate to give lectures to other students. For example, we had a sports medicine class uh, during our third year at the California school. And one of the lectures in my class was given by Richard Blake who he himself was still a student. He was a year ahead of us, Yeah. but he, he gave an incredible lecture. Um, I, I think it was on stress fractures, the etiology and management at that time. And that was just one of many things he was doing. He was, he was heavily involved in uh, research already and, and uh, writing and, um, and, and then he continued it. Uh, I really say at a very high level, his first five years into practice, and he quickly rose to become president of our sports medicine academy. And I really, um, I dove right into our academy as soon as I graduated from school, mainly because he was such a, an icon and a, uh, um, an inspiration. Uh, and I, I truly, yes, wanted to be like him uh, early on. I think, I, I'll be honest with you, I think he, he, he worked too hard at that and I think it, to a little uh, degree, explained why he sort of disappeared for about ten or twenty years, and almost, and just recently, has come back teaching mm. and has become visible. But nobody ever saw Rich for twenty years, including me. He did mention that on the podcast that he he? he took a a a large amount of time off, just to get his thoughts back together, and now he's come back uh, bigger and better. Yeah, yeah, like I told you, he lectured at our Western Podiatry Congress last week. That's the first time I've heard him lecture in at least 20 years. Yeah. But it was That's great to see him. I mean, he, he still had the same old enthusiasm and all the same. Yeah, you know, it was great. A very infectious, his his enthusiasm and energy and positivity for what he does and, and what we all do. Yeah, what what I like about it, it reminds me that you, usually you find there's a there's an era or a group of podiatrists that seem to go through and they're all that yeah a couple of years apart but they know each other at uni and it's like each other's career inspires and pushes the other one to be better which i think is really really good so yeah. I, it just reminds me of you would know Simon Bartold oh yes yeah uh, so I remember when Simon was on the podcast and Ted Jedniak was on the podcast and a few other people that all studied in Adelaide around the same time. And it's funny that I didn't ask them the question if one of them motivated the other, but it seemed to be this small group that were all quite close that have all gone on, done completely different things, but have all done very well and have become uh, part of that vital few in the profession. Well, you know, it's interesting, Rich, Rich Blake's class, the year ahead of mine, was an exceptional class. And in that class, three members of that class went on to become deans of schools of podiatric medicine, which is quite remarkable. Uh, that is. All in the same class, yeah. And several others in, in his class excelled and went on and 
various areas of research and teaching. And I think to exactly what you said, I think they all inspired each other. They weren't competitive because they were in different fields. Yeah. But they definitely inspired each other, which is, is really a nice thing to see. And that's how I know I'm getting the right people on this podcast. <laughs> because they're all into end. It's uh, because I mentioned also that uh, Dr. Timothy Shea was on the podcast as well. And I do have episode 202. And we we're talking about the history of podiatry. And that that episode just got, I was bouncing off the walls when I'd finished that. Especially what happens when I'm having the conversation like with you now, I'm hearing what we're, what we're talking about. But when I go back and edit it afterwards, because I edit every show myself, and then I'm slowly going through it and I'm listening to the conversation, I, I sometimes I feel really selfish. Should I get more out of this than anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> but you said, uh, Tim uh, Shay, he was one of your lecturers when you were at uni. He was. He, he taught one of the introductory courses, and I really think they chose him to uh, teach the course because he was a terrific motivational type speaker yeah. early on. He, he was in private. He, was, he had already started his practice. You could tell it was thriving in the East Bay area of, of San Francisco. He was full of energy. He was very well trained from our school. He had done a really good residency. And he just entertained us for an hour. He he got up and just talked about patients he had seen. And you, you didn't take notes in this class. You just sat and listened and realized, this is a great field I'm going into. If I could be like him and have a practice like him, it'll be the most perfect professional life you could have. And uh, I'll have to say, he's he. Uh, I think I emulated a lot of that, even though he wasn't a sports medicine uh, physician, although what he did, you know, early on, he discovered the value of manipulation therapy uh, as, as part of the global way to treat foot and ankle conditions. And he had a couple of podiatrists lecture us on manipulation and joint mobilization. And we thought this was a little bit out there and a little bit crazy. And, yeah. um, and I, by the way, I shared this from the podium last week with him sitting in the audience. And, and my particular area of interest has always been ankle sprains and chronic ankle instability. And over the last 10 years, considerable evidence has come forward showing the importance of joint mobilization and manipulation to restore function to the unstable ankle after an acute traumatic ankle sprain. It's absolutely integral to the rehabilitation process. And everything he was telling me back in 1978 is true. I yeah. didn't know that. And he was lecturing last week on foot mobilizations and manipulations. And I shared this with the whole audience with him sitting there. And I said, what he's going to share with you up here today is absolutely validated by a wealth of very high quality evidence. And if you're not doing this today, your patients are really getting shortchanged in their recovery, particularly from ankle sprains. Yeah, it's interesting because like Ted Jedniak is like the mobilization person here in Australia. That's how I'd first heard about it. But then when... Tim was on the podcast. I'm realizing he was doing this in like the, the mid seventies. I'm going, oh, yeah. I'm going, wow, it had been around for a lot longer than, than what we originally thought. Yeah. And the guys he brought into our class had been doing it since the sixties. Both of these guys were trained in what was called the Hiss clinic. And Tim might've shared this, but there was this famous physiatrist named someone Hiss, H-I-S-S, -S, who went up and down the California coast and he would see about 200 patients a day and just do joint manipulations. Uh, he, would oh, right, sit in, okay. he would sit in a chair with a circle of patients around him, uh, like he was the center of a big wheel and the patients would get in a chair and he would go around the circle. <laughs> by the time he finished the circle, there was a whole new set of patients that got seated and he would spin the chair around and manipulate each foot and then come back to the start again. My God, <laughs> what a, what a oh, way yeah. to work. Yep. <laughs> so, so at the moment, are you, you're still, you're in California still, I take it? Yes. Still live in my hometown of Long Beach, California. Okay. So you haven't moved. No, I like Long Beach. Yeah. And California, it is, it's one of those places that I've been there a, a couple of times and you see it on TV. So it is, it's one of those places that um, you sort of, you either love that type of lifestyle in that area or you want to be on the other wet, cold side. Go figure. 
I don't figure I live in Cairns, which is up in the tropics, and where yeah, at the moment it's our winter, and I'm just trying to figure out at the moment should I put the air conditioner on because I'm a little bit warm in my room here. <laughs> but I know down south it is absolutely freezing cold. So yeah, yeah there are there are benefits to a, a warm climate, but in summer it can get a little bit hot. So I want I want to move ahead a little bit. You've gone through your career. It was sports medicine that got you interested. You've graduated. You've gone through. Set up your own practice. How, how did the idea or the thinking of the Richie Brace start coming about? What were you seeing that made you realise I need I need to create my own my own device? Well, you know, I'll backtrack just for a second. And from the moment I, I entered podiatry school, I somehow developed an entrepreneurial spirit. I, I, I wanted to invent something that, that had to do with whatever I was doing. Uh, and the first thing I did in school was work with a professor of mine, Paul Shear, who was actually became quite well known in podiatry. He had a magic formula for an antiperspirant of the foot. Uh, okay. And I tested that and it didn't work by the way, but I got very excited that if it did work, this could be a big deal. Um, and then I went and worked for a very well-known uh, therapeutic hosiery company in North Carolina called Thorlow. They made sports specific socks and I helped them develop some diabetic hosiery that ended up being quite exciting. Uh, and then I worked with a fellow named Bill Olson to develop a composite foot orthotic material. And while we, I was doing that, I was working with a lot of foot orthotic labs and I, I became enamored with the idea of making orthotics more powerful by connecting them to the leg. You know, it just seemed to me that we're missing the boat here when, we, when we're just standing on top of a device that's yeah. supposed to control all the joints proximal. And so the idea of having a foot orthotic that somehow connected to the leg became intriguing to me. And I actually saw a brace that had a foot plate that articulated to what looked like an air cast type air stirrup ankle brace. And I said, well, there, there's something that looks like what we could do, but the foot plate was just a flat foot plate. And I went to the company itself and I said, I have an idea to customize this brace, but I, I, I don't want to infringe on your patent. And I would prefer working with you than against you. And they said, yeah. great. And so I actually had a partner at that time in developing the Ritchie brace because it actually became a, a challenge from a fabrication standpoint how to customize a foot plate, articulate it to the uprights and not have everything break and fall apart. And more importantly, how to make it work properly and be efficacious for what we thought it could do. Uh, that was back in 1996. Um, so it was uh, over 25 years ago. So a couple of questions there though, like this entrepreneurial spirit of wanting to invent something. Was it, was this like from you as a, as a child, you always wanted to invent something? Or was this once you became a podiatrist, you went, I want to invent something because I want my name to be to be out there somehow? Well, it wasn't so much getting my name out there. I really wanted to, yeah, I, I, even in college, I, I was I was basically a chemistry major. Yeah. And I was always amazed at all the research being done at my university to develop and discover new chemicals that would make a difference in something, whether it possibly cure cancer, possibly clean up the environment, uh, possibly, you know, make people's lives better. And I thought, I'd like to invent a chemical that does all that. Then I kind of got bored with chemistry. But <laughs> I, I, I realized that all of us have a potential to take an idea. And if we can implement it, uh, a lot of these ideas can change people's lives. And for me, that was the motivating thing. I didn't really want to get my name out there. I, and by the way, I didn't even name the Ritchie brace the Ritchie brace. I called it, I called it the fast brace, the foot and ankle system technology. And okay. I took, it to, I took it to the first orthotic lab to make it, and they said that's the worst name we've ever heard. And they <laughs> said we're going to think that when uh, they came here the next day. They said we're going to call it the Ritchie brace, and I said no way. I do not want my name on there. That's embarrassing. And they convinced me that that great medical products always have the inventor's name on it. And there is some truth to that. And I think yeah. people I think people remembered the Richie brace better than they remembered the fast brace. So the rest is history. That's funny. Because I actually said that to, um, to Richard Blake. I said, I always thought it was just referred to as the Blake inverted orthotic. 
he went, oh, let's not go down that track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's very he said, let's just call it the inverted authority because it's the yeah. same thing he has. Even though his name is attached to it and everybody knows the name is attached to it, he sort of felt a bit weird about it actually being there. So it sort of just came about. So it wasn't something you put there. It's sort of just <laughs> the, the original name was not very good at all. Exactly. And everybody, everybody knows it. it. It's to me, it makes sense that the inventor of something does put their stamp or put their name onto it because I don't know, it just makes sense. And then it's easy to, to know who to talk to if you want more information. Yeah. You know, it was a really, uh, I, I never really thought it would take off the way it did. Um, I knew it had great potential, but I really thought my vision was that it would be a sports brace only. Yeah. It, again, my interest was always in lateral ankle instability and trying to get the athlete back to play after a, an ankle sprain. And to me, a functional brace that articulated really could solve that need rather than putting them in a figure of eight binder gauntlet that restricts all motion and hampers their athletic performance. So, uh, and, and I thought there was a small niche for it in, in the sports medicine arena, particularly among uh, podiatric uh, providers, but it quickly became popular because doctors tried it on adult acquired flat foot and uh, tendinopathy and, and uh, Charcot arthropathy and all these disorders. I never envisioned that it could possibly work for, but it turns out it did. And so I have to say that was quite by accident that it had this broad acceptance and application to other pathologies. But thanks to that is why it really took off and became popular. Yeah, but if you hadn't have invented it for the original idea, then people wouldn't know what else they could actually use it for, which, is happen which happens a lot of times with different inventions. Well, what's really funny is the first 10 years, I, I worked very hard to teach the technology to my colleagues. I, I went to many scientific meetings around the country and I'd always, one guy would always come up after the lecture and say, I thought of that myself five years ago. I just never really had the motivation to go ahead and carry it through. And it was like, well, you should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy to have an idea after somebody else has invented it. Exactly. And, it's, and, right, and there's probably some truth to what he said. I, I remember in 1987, uh, I had to do a, oh, it might have been 88, it was my final year, I had to do a research project on a particular topic. Mine was, you do it on anything, and I chose to do uh, ankle injuries in, oh. in rugby league. So I went around to a whole pile of different suppliers and said, can you provide me different ankle braces? So I got a pile of different ankle braces off of these different companies. And I must have been the only person I think actually made money while I did my research project because some of them paid me to give them the results afterwards, <laughs> which I didn't have a problem with. Right. And so it was really interesting looking at all these different devices and I was comparing it to using ankle taping for right. certain injuries and then using these braces. And even though this only went over like a six month period, and even at the time, then I was talking to some other students, we go, wish there was a better way because these they were they were all okay, but there was nothing that was really great. But none of us ever had an idea to invent anything like what you did. <laughs> we just knew there were there were other options out there, but there we hadn't found the right one yet. And that was that was sort of the conclusion of my project. And that's what I told all the suppliers that what you had was good, but there was nothing that was fantastic. Yeah, and I th I think that's still true today. I mean, ankle braces. Uh, there's a lot more out there, but there's really not an ideal functional brace out there that uh, all athletes have come to accept. I mean, taping is still preferred yeah. um, by athletic trainers all over the world, and it's so archaic and restrictive, but that, that's just this art form that somehow keeps persevering and keep being propagated. Yeah, it depends. Um, yeah. I think most sporting teams, it's just part of what they do. It's a tradition. Sure. Got to tape before you go out in the field. You're absolutely right. And I know myself when I was playing basketball and I was playing rugby league and rugby union, I never went on the field without my ankles taped, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was very much prone to ankle injuries all the time. Yeah. And yet the studies show taping loses its mechanical support, usually after about 10 minutes of activity. 
pretty much. And more, more importantly, the cost of taping an athlete like, like you every day before practice and then before a game over an entire season compared to wearing a simple lace-up ankle brace, the cost is tenfold greater for taping. Yeah, well, now I, I have reusable ankle braces that I use because now I do Muay Thai, which lots of kicking, and I had a couple of ankle injuries again. So I now f- I found these braces that I, I put on, and they seem to work quite well because you can't, because yeah. you're kicking people and pads, yeah. you can only wear a certain thing and you can't, can't be bulky. Right. So, yeah, it sort of really restricts you sometimes with what, with what you can actually use. You wouldn't be able to wear a Richie brace for that. But that's no, okay. no, people, <laughs> even last night, I, we were doing some, some moves and the guy was supposed to put the pads out in front and then very quickly put them to his side. But he got it mixed up. And he put it out front and then he put it to the wrong side. And I already, I already started doing the kick and hit him right in the elbow. One, it hurt my foot, also hurt his elbow. If he had a Richie yeah. brace on, yeah, probably would have broken his arm. Probably. <laughs> so with, with your original design, how much change has there been over the years from what you originally came up with? You know, very little. Um, we, uh, the big changes were, were with the, cla- the plaster cast corrections. That's what really took the time. The basic, the design on paper of the foot plate and the articulation, the uprights, yeah. really didn't change much. But boy, it took a lot of work to get the cast corrections the way we, we, we wanted them. And, and most importantly, to make a comfortable fit. And that really has been the barrier to competition. Uh, you know, we have a lot of competitor braces out there that copy the Ritchie brace but nobody's really gained significant market share because they haven't really mastered that, that secret essence of that perfect fit for comfort and functionality. And that's really embodied in how we do the cast corrections. Yeah, I know a podiatrist over here in Australia who I think he told me he uses about 400, 450 Richie braces a year in, no in, in his practice yeah. and just absolutely swears by them. Yeah. <laughs> he just just thinks they're the greatest thing. So, with your entrepreneurial spirit, though, you you had a couple of different things that you're involved in. Then you came up with the Richie brace. What was next? Did you come up with anything after that, or once you did the Richie brace, you went, you know what? I think I've I've reached no, the no, peak. I, did you? What else did I, you come I, up I, after that? No, uh, I I kept uh, doing other things. Uh, I I had a, a complete failure after the Richie brace. Uh, with a very noble project, um, I went off uh, with, with uh, I had a partner, we developed a, uh, a new therapeutic hosiery product, a diabetic sock. It was a double layer sock system to dissipate shear force and dissipate uh, ground reaction plantar pressures. And it was really the first true diabetic sock introduced to the marketplace in the United States. And we invested a lot of money in it and risked a lot because we manufactured uh, hundreds of thousand dollars of product and placed it in retail pharmacies all over the United States uh, and nobody bought it. And we couldn't even get podiatrists to sell it in their office or recommend it or send their patients to the store. And um, we coined the word therapeutic hosiery um, because we didn't want to call it diabetic socks because that has kind of a negative connotation. And we abandoned the project. This was back around the time I launched the Ritchie Brace. And I will say today, I am told the therapeutic hosiery marketplace is over a hundred million dollars in size in this country. We were just about 20 years too early. Ah, uh, yeah, they always say it's not about you can have a whether it's marketing or a business idea, if it doesn't work, some people it, it may not be that it was a bad idea. It could just have been bad timing. Yeah, and I learned, I learned uh, that the other lesson I learned is you can have the best invention in the world, but if you don't have the capital behind you to market, it's going to yeah. fail. It's all about the marketing, the sales and marketing. And for the most part, that means having adequate funding. And we didn't have that. And we really didn't have the marketing strategy to deal with retail pharmacies. It was a world we, none of, neither of us had been in before. And so it, it was a lesson learned. Um, uh, and, and I, I wish somehow we could have persevered because it's a very noble uh, cause. I mean, any simple intervention to protect the diabetic foot from ulceration is noble. And, uh, you know, our, our, our 
our perception was we all wear socks. We all wear yeah. underwear. We all wear socks. Why not engineer a sock that could actually have protective benefits? And uh, we did that, but we just couldn't convince our colleagues and certainly the end user of the value of that. So now, because I've, I've spoken to a few podiatrists at the moment who ha- are starting to invent their own devices, and I'm going to have some more come on the podcast probably in the next couple of, couple of years, I'll have people coming on. So what you said then was about having the, the funding behind you to market your device properly. So if somebody is just starting out and they've got an idea, do you think they should be partnering, partnering up with another company or partnering up with someone who's already got a bit of a recognized name and therefore they can get the word out quicker? You know, that's a great question. Tyson, and I've, I've done both. Um, I, I learned early on, um, if you patent a product, if you develop a brand new invention and patent it and take it to a large entity like a footwear company, yeah, the royalties on it were just astounded me. I mean, it, you're lucky if they'll pay you 3% of, of, of the, the, the retail selling price of the product. Uh, and But at the same time, If you turn that over to them and license it to them, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to invest any more of your own money. You don't have to take any risk. You can just sit back and enjoy that 3% royalty, which if it's a big hit, you know, that could still translate into a a nice income. On the other hand, if you keep total ownership as we did our diabetic sock product and try to go out and do it on your own without the, the expertise and the financial backing, you're running a very big risk as I mm. learned. So I think there's a happy medium in between where you somehow retain the intellectual property, the patents, but you find a partner who sees the value of that and is willing to work with you and let you still be the driving force where you could all reap the benefits later. Uh, that, that, that's hard to find, but there are examples of that. And that's really what I did with the Ritchie Brace. I went out and literally partnered with uh, 10 very well-established foot orthotic labs. Yeah. They were already had a large customer base of podiatrists, very loyal customers. They were in the space called biomechanics, customized foot inserts. Introducing this new customized Ritchie brace was a perfect fit. And they did all the marketing and they enjoyed great profits. They paid me a royalty and we were all very happy. And so that was a formula that I still would fall back on today. I, I would, to answer your question, I think it's always better to seek a partner with a like-minded uh, goals and, uh, and a long-term uh, strategy where you can work together. And I think every, everything works much better that way. I think that's fantastic advice. And the other part too, you may be getting a smaller piece of the pie. However, if your name is attached to that device, and people get to know that you were the person behind that. Even when your career is finished, you will still be the person behind that. To me, that's yes. why it's the difference between being the lead singer of a band and just the drummer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because, because the lead singer great. of the band, even when the band breaks up, that lead singer could still go around and do gigs until they put him into the grave because it's his voice that's attached to that song. And so you're you're like the you're the lead singer of the the Richie Brace band. Well, I, and that, that's a great analogy, but uh, there is truth to that. I I get approached regularly by colleagues who have inventions, uh, products, and they want advice from me on how to do it. They've even asked me to. I get offers all the time to co-brand uh, devices under the Richie Brace umbrella, which um, I, I was going to I was going to say I'm sure yet. that would happen. Yeah. 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 It happens very frequently. I just haven't taken them up on it. Well, it is. It's one of those things because you've got that name that people know. Well, your name is now attached to something that works that is very popular worldwide. If they can get their name and your name attached together, yeah, the 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 Franklin Ritchie invention. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, there's a ring to that. Well, it was actually it's like um what's this thing it's it's called the franklin effect i don't know if you've heard of that at all but it's not but not me uh benjamin franklin actually and and he said if you can get somebody to do you a favor that they're more inclined to want to do you another favor later that makes sense 
like Whereas that. if if somebody if you if somebody does something for you or they or if you do them a favor and they feel therefore they feel obliged that they must do something back, they won't like you as much. So the people that always do things for other people, thinking, oh, they will like me, it actually has a negative effect. Whereas if you can get other people to do things for you, then they will actually like you more because it makes them feel good to actually do that. It's called the Franklin effect. Yeah. Not yeah, the Tyson Franklin I, effect, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think this has been great. So, if anybody wanted to reach out to you or talk to you, more, like they've got an idea, is there a way or the best way to sort of reach out and connect with you? Yeah. I mean, I, I welcome anybody to email me anytime. I have an old fashioned email address with AOL, but it's, I think you can put it up there, but it's D. Ritchie Jr., basically my name, yeah. at, at AOL.com. And I welcome, uh, email inquiries, conversations, chats, anytime. I will put that in the show notes as well. And you're also on LinkedIn, Doug Ritchie, easy to find. Yes. And Facebook, uh, the Ritchie Brace. That's that's easy to find on Facebook as well. Yeah, there, yeah, we have a Facebook page. We also have a LinkedIn page, and then I have my own page. Yeah, well, all the details that I have on you, I will put in the show notes so people can can track you down and stalk you at night while you're sleeping. Uh, okay. to make you sleep better so yeah. so doug i want to thank you so much for coming on the podiatry legends podcast sharing part of your story this has been like i said i know when i go back and interview this i'm going to be bouncing off the walls so uh, <laughs> i, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your story with me and, and with oh, the people my, who listen to the show it was my pleasure and uh just as you said it's really more like a chat together and i learned as much from you as hopefully you learned from me i learned heaps so thank you very much okay my pleasure.